On location in the Holy Land, David Taverner from UCB travels with Bible teacher and church pastor Mike Beaumont to trace the life of Jesus then and now. So we begin this journey, Mike, here in Nazareth because it was here that the coming of Jesus was first announced to Mary, revealed to Mary. I'm sure you're going to explain a bit more about that and where we are exactly. But uh, why actually haven't we started in Bethlehem? It's funny, isn't it, David? Because, yeah, that's often where people immediately associate the Christmas story, isn't it? And the story of Bethlehem and the birth and the manger and the shepherds and the wise men and so on. But of course, if we go back to the New Testament, it doesn't begin there. It begins nine months earlier than all of that. And it begins right here where we are in the town of Nazareth, where the angel Gabriel was sent by God to tell Mary about all that was about to happen. So we're in Nazareth, just sort of set that in its geographical location in in, in Israel today? Yeah, so um, Nazareth, we're in in Galilee, in the north of Israel, almost in the the middle of the plain there, in the north. Um, It's a town today that is uh, predominantly uh, an Arab town, Uh, and when we say Arab, that doesn't just mean Muslim, because many Arabs here, remember, many Palestinians are Christian, uh, as our guide and our driver are. So a a very mixed town today of about 120,000 people. But it would have been very, very different in the time of Jesus. Archaeologists have estimated that the village was probably no bigger than a couple of hundred people in Jesus' time. And it was a real backwater. It's a buzzing town and bustling town today. But in Jesus' time, a small village of a couple of hundred people, a real backwater, and and actually so much of a, a backwater that Nathaniel couldn't believe Philip when he said he found the Messiah because he'd come from Nazareth. And it was, what? Nazareth? Who's ever heard of Nazareth? Not even mentioned in the Old Testament. So a real backwater in those days. Remind us about the story, how it's recorded in in the Gospels. Yeah, I think that would be a good place to begin, uh, wouldn't it? So Luke's Gospel is the one that really helps us see what was going on here uh, in the story. Uh, And Luke begins his account, actually not with uh, the story of Mary, but with one of her relatives, with uh, Elizabeth and her husband, Zachariah, who is a priest. They were childless, and God sent the angel Gabriel to them to say that they were going to have a very special child who would turn out to be John the Baptist, who would prepare the way for Jesus, of course. And we're going to pick up the story, and we'll, we'll just read it from Luke chapter 1, where the same angel, Gabriel, is now sent by God for the second part of the story, which is to tell Mary how significant she is going to be. And so the passage that we're going to read from Luke 1, 26 begins with the words, in the sixth month. And that is in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. They'd been barren for years, weren't expecting children, although they'd longed for it. Now she found she was pregnant, and that pregnancy will end up serving as a bit of a sign and encouragement to Mary herself. So let's read the story of of what happened Uh, all those years ago, right here in Nazareth. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You found favour with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. 
The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. So that is the Annunciation, as it's called. It's, quite, it's not a word you hear very often. It's not, is it? But Annunciation means, quite simply, announcement. Uh, and we're sitting in the courtyard of the Basilica of the Annunciation, this fantastic church that we'll talk about in a few minutes, that commemorates this story. Yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful church, this amazing facade with all sorts of symbolism and representation and mosaics around this courtyard. You can hear some of the tourists and pilgrims in the background being shown around by, by their guides. But yeah, so that's the story as in the Bible. And here we are in Nazareth where it happened. So tell us more about the significance of this in the timeline of history. You said this is a backwater or was a backwater of a town. And, and this message came to this, this ordinary young girl. Yeah, very much so. But, you know, that often is how it is in the Bible. Um, God doesn't always use, as it were, the great and the good. He often picks out obscure people in obscure places. And that's absolutely true here. And I suppose these days, with 2,000 years of history, certainly in many traditions, Mary has become a very great and wonderful figure. But in this story, she's really... a pretty much a nobody if I can put it that way but God loves using the nobodies in the nowheres and that's one of the great things that stands out in this story that when it is time for the long promised Messiah to come it is a nobody that God chooses right through the Old Testament the prophets have promised again and again that God would one day send his Messiah his anointed one and that this Messiah would be the son of David, a descendant of David, a king who would reign. And, and all those ideas are picked up here in that word from the angel Gabriel to Mary as he comes and tells her, the time has come. It's like God's people have been waiting, 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 and we, we all hate waiting, don't we? And they'd waited and waited and waited, and from the end of the Old Testament to the beginning of what we now call the New Testament, there'd been 400 years of silence when God had said nothing, although he'd been at work in history helping set the scene for what would happen when Jesus came. But there'd been this waiting, and suddenly into this time of waiting and quietness, God breaks in as he so often does, and he breaks in by sending one of his greatest angels, Gabriel, with this fantastic message to this nobody in this nowhere place that she and it are going to become incredibly significant in God's purposes and you said that were maybe a couple of hundred people living in Nazareth at the time so I mean you would have thought word would have got round that something like this had happened <laughs> I'm sure it did and I'm sure tongues got wagging because you noted when we read the story that she was engaged but not yet married. Uh, she was technically betrothed, which was stronger than engagement. Uh, these days, engagement is, is a promise to marry, but sometimes it, it's not carried through. But in New Testament times, a, a betrothal in Jewish culture was as legally binding as marriage itself. There were documents signed, agreements made, and it was almost step one of the marriage process where the two young people and their parents committed to one another and a year later that would be turned into formal marriage. So here is this young girl who is betrothed, committed to Joseph, we learn in Matthew's Gospel, who suddenly finds herself pregnant. Now, come on, you know, one of my favourite things you know, David, is often to say to people, put yourself into the story. Yeah. Imagine how it would have been. I mean, imagine how you would have felt as Mary. I mean, we get a hint already when she says there to the angel, uh, excuse me, how can this be? 
I'm a virgin. She's very clear. She has not had sexual relationships with anybody. She's not had sexual relationships with Joseph. Hard for us to grasp in our culture, I think, these days, but that really was so important in those days. And so she's shocked. How on earth can this be? The angel's going to explain by a miracle. But as she comes to terms with it, and as Joseph, of course, has to come to terms with it, and Matthew's gospel tells us that the only way he came to terms with it by was, was by him too having a visitation uh, from God and God speaking to him in a dream at night through an angel and him hearing God explain what really had gone on and that Mary had not been unfaithful. And then, of course, there's the village, these other 200 folk. What on earth are they going to think as they see Mary's belly beginning to swell the tongues would start wagging and maybe in some ways that's why she stayed for some time that we finished our story uh, with the angel leaving her but luke goes on to tell us that mary then got ready uh, and hurried off to a town in the hill country of judea where she entered zachariah's home and greeted elizabeth and she stays there at least until john the baptist is born Maybe she stayed longer and maybe there was some circumspection in that. So this is, this is shameful. This is horrendous. The tongues would definitely have been wagging. And Mary has to guard these things in her heart because no one would understand really this miracle that the angel had explained to her was about to happen in her life. And literally because of that moment, uh, Nazareth has been put on the map for 2,000 years. And here we are in the town of Nazareth in front of what is known as the Church of the Annunciation. Describe just the, 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 the front of this uh, amazing, amazingly large building. It is, isn't it? I mean, as you come through that entrance gate, we just walked through, David, into the, the courtyard with all its pictures and mosaics of, of Mary uh, from all around the world. You know, we're faced with this huge facade of of white stone that towers up above us and the way the architecture is done is is to sort of lift our gaze upwards mm. to heaven yeah. which is where the story is all about of course the facade is slightly concave again so it draws you in but it also lifts your eyes heavenward there are windows above the main entrance door and to the side of each of the side doors that are almost pyramid-like in the way that they go up and the whole thing is designed to lift us up and there at the top of the facade carved into the stone is the angel Gabriel ah, yes. bringing his announcement to Mary on the left the angel on the right and underneath it in Latin uh, we've got Angelus Domini, the angel of the Lord, Nuntiavit Mariae, announces to Mary. So this is recalling what happened. Below, um, there are engravings into the stone of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mm -hmm. um, on the right here, again, in Latin, a, a quote from Isaiah, Eke virgo concipiet et pariet filium, et vocabitur nomen eus Emmanuel. The virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you shall name him Emmanuel. A quote from Isaiah chapter 7. And then underneath, in the pink stone, because the white stone facade has strips of pink, very pale pink stone running across, again in Latin, verbum caro factum et habitavit in nobis. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The quote there from John chapter 1, verse 14. That powerful summary of what was happening on a sort of cosmological scale through this incident of the angel coming to Mary. So before you've even stepped into the basilica, you have these scriptural reminders actually biblical reminders of the story and as you do step inside what do you see next yeah and as you step inside david i perhaps should just say as well even on the the great bronze doors leading us in there are scenes from the life of jesus and from the scriptures so so everything is placing this miracle of jesus coming into this world 
and lifting our eyes, taking our eyes backwards to the stories of the Old Testament and the Gospels, but lifting our eyes heavenwards as well. If we were to go in, what we'll see is a, is a modern church because this is, uh, this is very much a, a modern church. But it's like there's, there's part of the, the ground floor carved out because it lets you look down into what they call the lower church with the grotto of the Annunciation. And there is a, a cave dating back from the first century. And it's supposed to be in that cave where the angel Gabriel came and made this announcement. Why a cave? Well, often at that time, um, they made use of the natural caves in the rocks around here, of which there are many, and often would build a house on the front of it. So you've got you know, like your rear room provided for you there. And according to tradition, a tradition that goes back an awful long way, in fact, we know that as early as the fourth century, a Byzantine church was built on this site. So it's reminding us of that place where the angel came. Perhaps at that cave, and do you know what? If it wasn't at that very cave, I tell you what, it was very close to here. And it was certainly somewhere very much like this, that this world-changing event happens in this most obscure place, a little cave home in an obscure village with a message to, frankly, an obscure woman at that time. So you're saying that, in a sense, the exact place doesn't matter really too much, perhaps. It's the fact that it happened, a historic event. Yes, very much a historic event. You know, very often when you go around Israel, guides will say to you, look, there are three categories of places that you can visit. There's a number one, which is, we absolutely know this was the very spot. The biblical evidence, the archaeological evidence, the historical evidence all point to here. Then there's a sort of category two, which was, do you know what? We're not 100% if it was right here, but it was very close. It, it was somewhere here, or this was very much how it would have been. And then if we're honest, there is a sort of category three, which is, um, yeah, you know, <laughs> there's some tradition about this. But we know very much that this was, at the very least, a two. It was very close to here. And it was very much in that sort of setting that this happened. So it's not that it doesn't matter. And I'm not trying to say that the historical events really don't matter because all that matters is Christ in our hearts. No, Jesus was a real historical person whose feet walked upon this earth and met with real people and change real people's lives and this is such an exciting place because it just reminds you this is where it all began when wow think about it when God broke into this world like he'd never done before and also I spotted when you were reading from Luke's gospel that when Mary heard the angel she didn't say no way Jose she said how can this be I love that because it, it really shows, I think, the, the spiritual depth of this young woman. You know, there's no sort of arguing saying, don't be ridiculous, you know, I've not been with any man yet, how, can, you know, how on earth is that going to happen? It is a question of, I really don't see how this is going to happen, God, but it's not a no, never. And do you know what? There's something lovely about that attitude. Uh, and we've called our whole series Jesus Then and Now, haven't we? And, you know, what can we learn for now from that? I think, you know, we don't always understand what God is doing in our life. But to have that attitude that comes to God and says, what's going on here, God? How can this be? Rather than a no, never. She's leaving the door open for God to do more and to explain more to her. We can hear people in the background tourists being taken around with their guys. People come from literally all over the world to this particular town and this particular church and the mosaics which are above us and around, they're sort of on the walls around, beautiful mosaics. I don't know whether you could just uh, point out one or two and describe one or two. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, you know, even as we've been in this morning, I've heard English, I've heard German, I've heard all sorts of uh, languages uh, of the tourists and the guide. And yeah, in this courtyard that surrounds the church are some beautiful mosaics so just right here with us we've got 
one from Bolivia, and they're done very much in the style of those countries, which brings home to us, I think, that, you know, faith is not just a, a Western thing. It really does work all around the world. So we've got Bolivia, we've got Andorra, uh, Iraq, the Vatican, Ireland, Armenia, Egypt, done in a very sort of African Islamic style. These there. are all portraits, if you like, of, of Mary. Yeah, absolutely. And if you look, they're all very different. And, and I love it because they're all in very different styles. So the one here from India, Mary there is, is almost Indian. Uh, in appearance, which, which is beautiful. The, cl the colour of the clothes, the, the fabrics that she's wearing and so on, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And again, underlining that, you know, Christian faith is, is not just for one people and one nation, but, yeah, we see all of these, and, and these are all provided by different nations of the world. And obviously we appreciate that Mary in different traditions is, is, is venerated in, in, in different ways, but when you go back to the Bible story, we are talking about what is referred to, ultimately, after his coming, as the virgin birth. Yes, and that's not a term that's used in the New Testament itself, but it's certainly uh, what we refer to it as, the virgin birth, when the Word became flesh, to, to quote from those words there on, on the church front, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now... <clears throat> Do you know what we need to say? People in the first century understood as well as us today where babies come from. You know, they knew they didn't grow under a gooseberry bush and they didn't drop out of heaven. So when Mary's saying, how can this be? It's because she understands enough biology to know this ain't going to happen. And yet, it has happened. <laughs> and she's not challenging that it happened. She's wanting to know how on earth can it be? And God explains, look, the only way this can happen is a miracle. And, and I always say to people when they say to me, well, you know, explain to me the, the mystery of the virgin birth. And I say, I can't, it's a mystery. It is a miracle. It, it is God intervening in this world in a way that has never happened before. And scholars also call it the incarnation from two Latin words, incarne, in the flesh. This is the this is the account of how God came into this world in the flesh, real flesh and blood. I love the word John uses in his gospel. He says the word became flesh. And the word he uses there, zarx, is, is a word that we might use, meaning like flesh and blood. The word really did become mm. flesh and blood, real stuff, this stuff. Pinch yourself right now and feel it. That's what God became. Now, now, why is he doing it? Why, why did he need to do that? Well, he's doing it because he's, he's wanting to deal with the root issue of human sin. And the only way he can do that is, as it were, by beginning the human race all over again. Just like he began it with Adam. So he's going to start again. The New Testament actually refers to Jesus as, as the last Adam and the second man. He is God beginning again. He's creating a brand new human nature for his son Jesus within Mary's womb. And I don't know how it happened. But somehow, miraculously, the second person of the Trinity in the Godhead, Jesus, takes on human flesh. It's as if he allows himself to be reduced, 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 to grow there within that womb of Mary. Did the Holy Spirit take Mary's egg and, as it were, fertilize it, or did he create something brand new from nothing? Do you know what? The Bible doesn't answer that sort of question. I suspect it was the latter, but we're simply not told. But believing that Jesus was born of a virgin isn't an optional extra. You know, if Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, then frankly, David is no different to you and me. And you and I know that we can't save the world. There's sin in our life, we get stuff wrong, but Jesus is going to be born of a virgin so he can be born sinless and maintain that sinlessness throughout his life by the power of the Holy Spirit and depending utterly on him, leading him to 
utterly obey God at every point and so be that perfect human being who could one day die on the cross to pay the price of our sins. There's a strange contrast in a sense between the humility of this story featuring Mary and the scale of this church. Uh, I mean, I in the town of Nazareth, it dominates. It's, it's, it's a major landmark, isn't it? Oh, it is. And frankly, it's what everyone comes to Nazareth for today, to see this magnificent building. And it is magnificent. I mean, just as we sit out here outside looking at it, it you're just taken over, aren't you, by the grandeur of it. Now, of course, for some Christian traditions, Mary herself does become a very grand figure uh, and for some christian traditions that's very important for other christian traditions they feel that perhaps that goes overboard a little bit and we're not here to come down on one side or the other but i think in building a building like this what those who did it have wanted to do is to whatever christian tradition we come from it is to take us back to the wonder of what god can do through an ordinary person whose life is given to him and from that very ordinary person, this, this building says to us, look, look at what God can do. Look at what God can build from an ordinary person. Lift your eyes, because it's taking us up, up, up into the sky, way beyond Mary, way beyond Gabriel, to lift us up to see the one who this story is all about. And it's not ultimately about Gabriel. It's not even ultimately about Mary. It is about God who so loved the world that he sent his son into this world in the only way that he could to pay the price for our sin. I don't think anybody who visits here can help but be impressed and indeed moved. I'm sure you can remember the first time perhaps you came here and the impact it had on you. Just share a little thought and maybe just pray with us as well. Yeah, I remember the first time I walked through those gates and I visited here many times now. I just thought, wow wow look at this but for me it, it's not a wow about mary it's not a wow about jesus it, it, it's a wow about the god who loves people enough to come into this world but who is able to take ordinary people who will humbly submit their lives to him and and use them and we've called our series, haven't we, uh, Jesus Then and Now. And, you know, Jesus can still do this. Today, every listener who's listening to our program, if, if we will just say, God, I'm available, I'm here, like Mary did, you're not going to get another virgin birth, that's one thing for sure. But who knows what God could do through you today, this week, this month, this year, if you were just to say, with God, nothing's impossible. Lord, let it be to me as you want it to be. Here I am. I'm available. So for me, it's a very humbling place. And in a sense, that towering facade in front of us, I think, makes you humble. And that's a good place to be before God. Lord, you are the God of the unexpected. For Mary certainly didn't expect her encounter with your angel that day and the word that he brought to her from you. May we be ready today to be surprised by the God of the unexpected. May we be open and available as Mary was so that Jesus can use us today just as you used Mary. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mike Beaumont and David Taverner in the Holy Land tracing the life of Jesus then and now. Check out the UCB website for the free episode guide with photos, Bible references and background information. Go to ucb.co.uk forward slash Jesus then and now. And you can hear more 30 minute conversations with Mike and David talking about the Bible on the UCB player app. Under podcasts, just select Bible books 
Bible biogs or Bible surprises. 